Okay, it's recording, right? It's kind of hard to tell from the front. Hey guys, this is Jen, aka Laurel Evies, here with a new fridge duck for you, all about the crazy but still beloved Gamzy Makara. Trying something new here. Uh, I upgraded Phil with this passive editing mode so he can, well, edit videos when I'm not there. I recorded parts of the episode already, and Phil will interdisperse them as I get to them, but that's... everything's kind of in a testing thing right now. That's kind of why I'm out here, testing the limits as it is. So, I'm gonna keep on walking and see what happens. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I don't exactly remember walking uh, this far out, but there's <laughs> nothing weird about that, right? <laughs> Let's get start the intro. <laughs> Gamzee Makara was named by Alyssa on the MS Paint Adventure forums, after a fellow forum goer named Gammy. This is not to mention other similar sounding words, like, for example, the word Gamze, a Turkish name meaning dimple, or the word Gamze, which is German for chamois, a species of goat antelope native to Europe. Gamzee's family name actually has a lot of possible meanings attributed to it. Makara is the Arabic word for deceit or scheme, fitting given Gamzee and his ancestor Kurlos do their share in devious masterminding. Makara can also be translated to dragon in Shinhala. It can also come from the Scottish word Makar, which means bard. His last name might also come from a breed of goats called Makar goats, whose horns have a similar shape to his. Which, if you consider that a goat's visage is used as a Satanist symbol, could reference to him becoming an antagonist. <laughs> However, Gamzee's last name is most likely a reference to the Makara, the Sanskrit counterpart of the Capricorn sign. A Makara is a mythological cre Hindu creature with hind legs of an aquatic creature and the four legs of a terrestrial one, much like Capricorn, which Gamzee's Lucis is based off of. The land-sea duality in Gamzee's goat dad could be representational of Gamzee's dual nature, as well as his high blood status among troll kind. The highest of the land-dwelling variety, but below the water-based aristocracy. Gamzee's connection to royalty is connected to his purple color, purple being the color of royalty in European countries. Not to mention, purple is also associated with death in some East Asian countries, which might relate to Gamzee's desire to kill the other trolls. With six different styles, Gamzee's typing quirk is without a doubt the least consistent throughout the webcomic, fitting with the last half of his screen name, Terminally Capricious, since capricious means impulsive being capricious is one thing. It can be kind of endearing, see Mr. Rochester from Jane Eyre, but it's entirely another story when your brain has been rotted due to drug use. <laughs> Stay away from drugs, kids. Don't use drugs. Hmm. My phone GPS seems to be acting up. Uh, hang on, I think I, is, I think I see someone up ahead. Hey, could could you possibly Wait a minute. You're you're not When it comes to the background behind the creation of the Makara family designs and mannerisms, there's a lot more than meets the eye. Of course, Kurlos looks like the cross between a Dia de los Muertos Calavera and a voodoo witch doctor, and the fans of MSPA in general will know the nods to the bard from Bard Quest and subsequently the clown bard from Problem Sleuth, mixed with the juggalo fans of the rap group, the Insane Clown Posse. But the references go even deeper. References from before MS Paint Adventures even existed. Back in 2005, future Homestuck creator Andrew Hussey wrote and drew a graphic novel series known as Whistles. Yeah, Hussey can draw. I was surprised, too. 
It started online, but by 2007 the series was published in three volumes, with an unreleased fourth chapter floating around on the internet. The story followed the naive antics of the titular clown Whistles, who worked for a circus called the Starlight Calliope. I like that name. It kind of reminds me of someone from somewhere. He shows absolute loyalty to the circus ringmaster, Pendlecoat. My, that's an interesting beard pattern right there. Despite all the evidence proving that his master was not a nice guy by any means. Can you say clown eating? It gets to the point where Whistles becomes so enraged by a mob attacking Pendlecoat that he sets the crowd ablaze and kills almost everyone before escaping with his master. There's even a point where Whistles becomes the adoptive father to a younger version of his master. It, it makes more sense in context. A perfect mirroring of what Gamzee eventually does with Caliborn in Homestuck. Please. Please, 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 please. We're gone. Oh. What even was that thing? Oh, cue out of breath jokes. All right, Jen. All right. Professionalism. Just finish the next paragraph and you can head on back and everything will be a okay. I I don't remember writing that. What is even Miss Jen, please wake up. Oh Lord, this is all my fault. I should have never What the hell is that? Phil, get away from it! Ugh. What was that? The script. What? There's a page missing. There's a couple of them missing, actually. Oh. But that was definitely Laurel Leaf and Phil. But it doesn't make any sense. I don't. I could have sworn I shut Phil off for the. Wait. I. I don't rem- did I- did I shut Phil off? I- something is definitely going wrong here, but- Where even am I? This wasn't where I was before. Just- great. I need to check the GPS. Hang on a sec. Gamzee's ancestor was the Grand Highblood, the pre-scratch version of Kurlos Makara, and the leader of the Subjugulators, a group of bloodthirsty warriors who worshipped the mirthful juggalo clown messiahs. The Grand Highblood was in charge of keeping the lower castes in check during his reign, operating much as an enforcer for the Condus's regime. Due to this connection, it's highly possible that he is responsible for the fate of the Sufferer and many of his followers, considering it was the Highbloods who banished Executor Darklear because of his failure to kill the Disciple. The next time the Highblood is mentioned chronologically is after Orphaner Dulscar ends his kismicitude with Marquis Spinneret Mindfang, and he offers her location to the Highblood. However, due to his capricious and unpredictable nature, the Grand Highblood kills Dulscar when he's unable to tell a good joke. Despite this, the Grand Highblood apparently took the threat Mindfang posed seriously, and sent his wild card, Neophyte Redglare, to apprehend her. His descendant mirrors this action by sending Terezi Pyrope to deal with Vriska Serket, albeit under false pretenses. A major quirk for the Grand Highblood is that he liked to decorate his walls with the blood of his victims, a gory rainbow that included blood from all the castes, excluding the Condus's fuchsia, the rare mutant candy red, and his own cast's purple blood for obvious reasons. In fact, the frame on screen is the only time which the now extinct lime blood color appears, and therefore the only in-comic evidence that it ever really existed. Gamzee imitates his ancestor's trophy wall, 
by writing messages on the walls with the blood of his fellow trolls, but he also subverts it by writing messages in his own blood in the styles of his fellow trolls. The Grand High Blood is the only ancestor whose name does not follow the eight-letter rule that all adult trolls seem to follow. The Grand High Blood is also one of the few ancestors who most likely died of natural causes, a fate shared by the Meow Rail's ancestors. Gamzee, despite outrageous odds, manages to complete his ancestors' unfinished business by killing Nepeta and Equius to make up for Executor Darklear's mistake during the sufferer's death sentence. On a much larger scale, Gamzee also fulfills his entire blood cast's business by tending to and serving the Cherub Caliborn, who he saw as an idol from his religion. Of course, the GPS isn't working. We're anywhere from Walnut Creek to San Francisco. Anyway, speaking of an interesting connection between the troll and the cherub, one truly eye-opening theory is that Gamzee's actions on the meteor were due to Caliborn possessing him. Gamzee goes completely over the edge only after he's shown staring directly into little Cal's eyes, an act that causes, at the very least, some partial control to the Caliborn amalgamate dwelling within it. It's also here that Gamzee's typing quirk is shown to change, where he's yelling like Caliborn every other line. And there's that quote that foreshadows Gamzee's true relationship to Lord English when he says that the mirthful messiahs of his High Blood's religion were both him. This is found to be true as he is a component of Lord English, in multiple senses. It's also entirely possible that Gamzee's invincibility is due to an extremely metafictional fact, known as the Joker immunity. This trope explains that an enemy character with enough importance and popularity can never be killed for real. It gets particularly punny due to the name of the trope, which was created after Batman's hilarious rascally clown nemesis. It may also be a reference to the popular juggalo idea that wicked clowns never die. This seems to be a fact throughout Homestuck's alternate and scratched sessions, as we never see any evidence of any other Gamzees in the dream bubbles. This Gamzee's all that exists, and that is crazy. Gamzee's strife specify are the Joker kind and club kind. Joker kind, true to its name, is the wild card of all specify, seemingly able to give its owner any kind of weapon they want. It's been known to dispense Gamzee's clubs, Carcat's claw sickle, Tavros's fetus spear, a whip, Equius's bow, and even the war hammer of Zillihu. Meanwhile, the only set of actual clubs he ends up using have been the Deuce clubs, a reference to the similarly unassuming yet effective killer of the Midnight Crew, Clubs Deuce. An interesting fact is that this pair of juggling clubs was never upgraded. This is a testament of how strong Gamzee is, considering that, according to Carcat, it was Gamzee who took out most of the Black King's health in the last battle in the Trolls game session. I guess we can agree that Gamzee made her death quick and can finally put to rest the theory that Gamzee took his sweet time killing Nepeta, which was a fan speculation back in the day. I guess, I don't know, I wasn't there. I don't even know how I got here. One interesting characteristic that many of you viewers might know is that Gamzee is a poster child of the stuffed in the fridge trope. The trope is a storytelling cliche where a character is killed off in a gruesome manner and left to be found, for example, in a fridge, just to offend, insult, or cause anguish to another character who finds them. This term became more broad over time referring to any character who is targeted by an antagonist and, in turn, killed off, incapacitated, depowered, or brainwashed for the sole purpose of affecting another character and motivating that character to take action. Gamzee, of course, the classy guy that he is, also made this a literal element due to storing the remains of his friends in a fridge and eventually gets stuffed in the fridge himself. I think a lot of you guys thought this series was named after this trope, which I won't 
completely deny because of how I made the opening sequence, but I really named the series after topics in the fridge category, like fridge logic and fridge horror, where you randomly remember facts about a piece of media as an afterthought. What was that? Okay, <laughs> I guess I'm just getting a little jumpy. How did it find me? I don't even know where I am. If I wasn't lost before, I certainly am now. But I don't know where home is. And it's getting dark. And it's getting harder and harder to read my script. It's... It's back. It's not going away without some kind of interference. What are we gonna do? I've got an idea. No, Murky, you're gonna hurt her! Wake up! Ow. What was even... Are you kidding me right now? Oh, God. Gamzy is the Bard of Rage. Considering that both the class and the aspect are not as analyzed in-depth in the comic as I would have liked, little information exists about what either are fully capable of. As described by Calliope, a bard can either allow destruction of an aspect or invite destruction through the aspect, making it the passive counterpart to the prince class. As the bard of rage, Gamzi allowed himself to be placid and peaceful, mainly through the consumption of soper slime throughout the hive bent part of the game session. However, once the slime was gone and his rage finally set off due to the interference from two different time players, he begins to kill trolls and beheads them for fun. He invites Terezi Pyrope to destroy Vriska Serket by spurning her rage through the exploitation of her love of justice. He later allows his moiralance with Karkat to die away and even destroys Terezi's sense of self-worth due to his negative influence as her kismesis. Likewise, Cronus Ampera, the Bard of Hope, allowed Hope to be destroyed by giving up his destiny and all his dreams of becoming a wizard. While the Hope aspect can be seen as holding on to positive emotions and friendliness, Rage is seen as its opposite, channeling the player's anger and negativity against their foes. Another opposite between the two is that Rage players also seem to get into and remain in romantic and platonic relationships more than Hope players do, but they do end up abusing their partners or using them for their own ends. It's also worth noting that Hope players tend to be usually harmless in their actions and be focused and skilled on elements of science, while the Rage players we have seen are ruthless in both strength and cunning and hold to very strict religious beliefs. I won't hold that against you, hussy. I do not personally know what kinds of religious people you've run into during your 38-year existence. Maybe you had to endure Westboro Baptist kind of stuff. It's always been my philosophy to try to, you know, look at the belief systems objectively, believers' actions removed from the equation, because Due to being imperfect beings, humans can still be a bit garbage, no matter what stance. And on the opposite side of that point, just because people are sincere in their beliefs doesn't mean that they're, that they're sincerely wrong. Anyway, you seem like a nice enough guy, hussy. Uh, a bit of a troll, but nice. I might suggest reading... Lee Strobel's Case for Christ, or C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. If I wasn't going to die up here, there's a rope hanging from a tree. That's just pleasant. It found me. Again. I just wish I knew what to do. I can't seem to get away from it. I'm just so lost and scared it's, everything just seems like one really big nightmare Ugh. 
What happened? Miss Jen, thank goodness you're all right. You had us really worried. What was the big idea? You decided that the headspace of all places was a good napping location? Wait, I fell asleep? Is sleeping dangerous here? It can be. It leads to dream within dream kind of crap. You know, like... Jeez, I didn't know that. And why in the world did you shut off Phil? Didn't you know that's super dangerous when you're in the headspace? I don't... I don't remember turning off Phil. Is... Is everything okay? What? Yeah! Of course everything's okie dokie Loki. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Wait, wasn't Laurel Leaf and the Eevee just here? Are you sure there isn't anything I sh- Hey, you still have a paragraph to go for the Gamzee episode, right? Why not finish it and you can get started on homework for your storyboard class. Okay. And the last fridge stuck fact for Gamzee Makara is... Gamzee's list of references continues. In 1993, Nintendo made a game for the SNES called The Secret of Mana, with one of the more odd NPCs being the Dancing Shopkeepers. This connects to Gamzee because, in Alternia Bound, he offered Carcat a nap in the pile of obnoxious noisemakers for 420 boon dollars. He also served as a more literal shopkeep in Miststuck, where he sells every potion for 420 boon dollars each, leaving poor, naive Jane to wonder why they're all that price. But yeah, 420. Of course, all of Gamzee's drug reference could be connected to the fact that his name can be translated from Turkish as Jained, as in high from smoking pot. Wait. Is that why he likes to hang out with Jane all the time? Thank you guys so much for watching this Fridge Stuck episode for Gamzee Makara. I hope you enjoyed. Any facts I missed? Do you have a character or concept that you'd like to see? Leave it down in a comment below and it might end up on the show someday. Be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and share with a friend. And I will see you all next time. Bye! Wow, an entire Gamzee Makara episode and not a single- I'm... so... sorry. No need to scowl. Guess we know where Jen got her resting face. <laughs> I have no excuse for slacking off in my duties. Times have been taxing in my department as of late. But we were lucky. We caught the shadow and secured the young cellar again. Believe me, I know the dangers that lurk deeper in the dark, almost as well as you. And I swear, as long as she has a sharp brain, a cheerful spirit, a hopeful heart, a logical guide, and a fearless body to protect her. Jen will never succumb to her influence. So she still seems to be in the dark over what's going on around here. Well, I guess that technically makes two of us. <laughs> but someday soon, I know that no one, not her pathetic animus, nor her incompetent archetypes, will be able to stand in my way. 